Right, before I start, first and foremost, I'd just like to obviously thank the Bible Society for obviously asking me along to um, do the underwater and showing the underwater filming. I do fish for Bible myself, but today's going to be about uh, the filming of Bible underwater. And it was last weekend I managed to, which I'm going to show today, um, Bible actually spawning underwater. We had all the cameras in and we've literally captured everything on film and managed to get 14 hours. Um, so it's a bit of an un unedited clip that you're going to see towards the end. But what I'll do is I'll start playing and then I'm going to go through how we obviously go about filming Babel because um, I've done this for about 30 years now. So rivers for me have always held an air of mystery to be quite honest and I think it's a world that we know very little about because um, I think in the UK there's only really myself and the likes of Jack Perks that are doing obviously the underwater filming I know Jack covers a lot of the wildlife as well where it's purely based um, literally in fresh water I've spent 30 years filming the, in the rivers up and down the country um, on average 30% of my filming turns out to be a success 70% is complete failure because generally when I'm doing a film people watch it and they automatically assume that as soon as I get in the water I land on fish and it's not always the case certainly with the barbell footage you're going to see today sometimes I can be laying three to four hours in the water waiting for the shoals to actually come up um, and it doesn't always happen there's a lot of failure rate in the filming that I do um, but I'm going to go through how we actually get the shoal to come to me because past times of filming I've um, tried to get and follow the shoals which was a mistake so I now get the shoal to actually come to me where I can obviously do the filming and I don't use static cameras so all the filming that you're going to see today is with me actually in the water um, using various pole cams um, Sometimes I'll use a small type of GoPro, but I also use a bigger type of camera when I'm filming the uh, when I'm filming the, the Bible. So the Prince of the River, I was always told that it would be impossible to actually get in UK rivers and actually be in the middle of these shoals of fish. Um, and I've had some amazing success. Um, how I actually film Babel is location is literally the key for me. So I'm looking at a section of river round about three feet deep at the most. And what I always start with before I even get the equipment on and everything is I'll always put a bed of hemp down. It just works for me because all my filming is done on the river wharf and the river swale. This is the river swale. So I've always found that the hemp tr actually attracts the shoal in. Once they're starting to feed, I will then generally get in the river a little bit higher upstream and then I'll slowly work my way down. Sometimes it can take up to half an hour for me to slowly get down to where these barbels are shoaling. Sometimes they'll move away, but I've got this theory that when they know that there's food there, they do always come back. And the key to any filming of any fish is not to go in like a steam train. Literally have lots of patience and um, just basically take your time with no sudden movements. One of my theories, because we've all seen as um, anglers um, when barbel actually roll and flash, I've got a couple of theories on that. People have said to me it's about um, sometimes they'll be um, messing up the riverbed to try and release food. Um, I do think that's true, but I also think that they'll actually sometimes, because we've, we've actually managed to film them rolling a lot slower and actually doing that roll just below the surface and literally being inverted and taking fly off the surface um, which for me was fascinating I also think they do it as a playful thing um, I think it, they're a little bit like us I think when we're feeling good about ourselves they've got this, a little spring in the step and certainly with the small ones they do exactly the same I still think there's a lot, lot more that we can learn about Barbel. Um, for me, they're an absolutely fascinating fish. Pardon? Oh, sorry. Um, Barbel actually have the ability to alter riverbeds. 
Um, and I, the, I think it's actually called the Zoo Geomorphic. And I think it was Calvert and Fish Farm when they actually emptied one of the ponds where um, they got the barbel in. That actually, the barbel had actually scooped out a three foot section of this pond. Um, and we've actually filmed barbel um, moving big rocks. And sometimes if they want to get under a rock, they'll actually shunt the rock out of the way. Um, they'll also um, pick up river debris as well with the mouths and move it to the side and actually deposit it and then go back and they'll actually start feeding. And on an average filming session, which um, when I'm actually filming barbel, I'll generally use round about three kilos, kilos of hemp. We've also found that um, we, we started to introduce some of the smaller pellets, um, which, it, which worked on the swale. But then we started introducing some of the bigger baits, and we've, we've done this on various rivers. And on the swale, the bigger baits seemed to spook the fish off, but then they actually eventually came back. But then we did some filming exactly the same process on the river wharf and the bigger baits literally had no effect. The barbel just stayed there and obviously started feeding. So a friend of mine actually decided to pick up that he'd start obviously using the smaller baits. Um, again, I, I can only really comment on the likes of the rivers that we've been filming on, on the various sections because barbel, although they have the same characteristics, I do believe in certain rivers they may operate slightly different. They're also a very, I find them to be a very social creature, to be quite honest. Um, they certainly operate in a shoal. And I think one of the problems now I'm facing when I'm filming in rivers is there's a lot more water users. So we're getting the paddle boarders and the canoe people come in. And on many occasions I've been filming and the canoes come through and the barbel have literally just shot off. But they've always returned about 15 to 20 minutes later. Uh, but yeah, that's one of the biggest problems I'm now facing is there's obviously a lot more water users obviously on the river. One thing I'd like to try and do is to actually get barbel and actually film them taking fish because I do know there's a lot of my friend, uh, friends that are anglers actually have do a lot of spinning and they've actually caught barbel on lures. Um, and they've obviously got the, the pharyngeal teeth actually based in the throat as well. Because um, I think this is something that Jack Perks picked up on as well. Um, young Barbel, because we did some filming last year, and last year, I think it was in the Anglin Times, they mentioned that there was um, a possible Barbel boom. And I think last year for me was probably one of the best years of filming young Barbel. And I've literally now got apart from the larvae stage where they just hatched i've got the entire life cycle of barbel on film um, but locally to me on the river wharf there was a lot more smaller barbel and different year classes um, from around about eight months up to about five years but nothing big um, one of the problems because i'm big campaigning to do with the pollution as well um, alongside fergal sharky and various other organizations up and down the country and one of the biggest problems I'm facing locally to me is the agricultural runoff and um, one of the what used to be the local spawning area for Barbel um, this time of the year now is literally smothered in a thick carpet of algae um, and you're talking around about 12 inches deep and we've done various testing and it's, coming, it's showing very high levels of nitrates and phosphates as well. Well, these are the young barbel that I was filming. These are around about probably three to four inches long. It's surprising when you're underwater and you're actually filming these barbel, they actually do blend in. And it wasn't until I think the fourth session that I actually realized they'll actually got barbel. It sounds ridiculous, but you, you, when I'm filming, you do tend to get tunnel vision actually in the water. And it was the shape of the head um, because it doesn't really pick it up because on this particular time this, it was an overcast day but the, the head of the barb, small barbel is more orange and it all, it's got like a bit of a parrot shape to it. Um, so for me to actually film these was fascinating. Um, they tend to, at this age, certainly on the river wharf, that they are certainly living in the shallow water. This type of depth of water is around about two feet and they're mixed in with the likes of grayling 
and Gudjin as well. Um, obviously, Gudjin is obviously part of the Babel family, um, and Gudjin actually have the same type of characteristics as Babel because Gudjin will flash as well. We actually did filming um, last year of Gudjin trying to take minnows, which completely surprised me. So the young Babel is obviously sitting in the shallow currents. Um, with that type of depth, what I generally do is I'm using a snorkel because two feet is no good put, obviously putting the scuba tanks on. But if they have literally got the same characteristics of the adults. Um, they'll do the roll flash. They tend to be a lot more dispersed at this age as well, to be quite honest, as opposed to being obviously in more of a tighter shoal. What is interesting is when I'm underwater is the view that I have from, from underwater actually on the riverbank and even in the murkiest of water I can actually see everything that's going along the riverbank. The view you've got from underwater looking up is absolutely fascinating and when I am underwater I can hear people talking on the bank. It's surprising how far that sound actually does travel. Um, what I have found as well is that when when Babel do get spooked, they will return quite easily, certainly at this age. And I think one of the main things I picked up with these is they literally have no fear of anything. They're unaware of the dangers, obviously, because we've got the predation, um, not only from otters, but we've, we've got big problems with cormorants as well on this particular section. Um, but they have literally got no fear of danger. And I. There's been a few times where I've actually managed to film, uh, actually feed them out of my hand. And I do barbel fish myself, um, but I've got to admit my filming is better than my angling. And I'm not going to stand here and tell you how to fish for them because you'll blank. Um, my problem is that obviously I don't get out on the bank enough to be quite honest. You know, if there's a chance that I can be in the water filming these fish, I will always opt for that. But there are, it, it's nice at times just to be out on the bank and actually um, catch barbel. Um, as I said, that they're mixed in with various different species of fish and they're feeding on the algae and very, very small little uh, river flies as well. And it's surprising how fast that even at this age what they can actually devour. Um, and certainly the big adults, when we've been filming them with um, the hemp and the pellets, they can clean a section of riverbed really, really fast. Um, young barbel tend to, um, obviously I've said they tend to be a lot more dispersed. Um, through my filming, compared to when I started 30 years ago, I, I'm now finding that the barbel tend to be more in pockets as opposed to be a little bit, as opposed to be more dispersed throughout the river system. So for me, it's, um, it, it's finding these locations and obviously the problem with rivers is that obviously you get the floods coming through each year and this particular site that I film at every year is a completely different area. It's like entering a new section of river because obviously it's changed, the, the shingle and the rocks and everything have been moved. Um, and I, I think that's the, for me that's the fascination about rivers is that you've got these cycles that the river system actually goes through. Um, making them quite unique to be quite honest um, but I know when I started filming um, certainly 30 years ago it wasn't uncommon for me to film shoals of grayling 400 to 500 strong I'm now filming them in pockets of about 30 to 40 um, so there's, there's there's big changes going on um, I think obviously the amount of sewage that's going on in some areas because certainly to me there's one area it, it's been decimated with the amount of sewage that's going in um, how we tackle that and get through that um, I'm quite unsure it's going to be uh, it's going to be very very difficult um, one thing I want to try and get into this year is um, moving on to the baits that um, as barbell anglers you use and I'm, I'm wanting to try and um, adapt a type of camera system so that we can actually film barbell taking the baits because as far as I'm aware I don't think there's actually any footage of a barbell actually being hooked and played underwater and uh, again a lot of that's down to luck you can only plan it so far and then you've got to it, it, it's purely down to luck. We, I did try it actually 
um, three years ago on the River Swale um, and literally it was a complete failure, absolute disaster. Um, we actually have filmed them where um, we've actually put the odd static camera in and the barbel have literally taken all the free offerings and literally left the hook bait. You know, and it's surprising, you know, if there's something untoward, I do think they do pick up on it, to be quite honest. Um, as I say, coming up um, soon, we've got the, uh, the, the, the spawning footage, which for me, um, hopefully, should be a real, real eye-opener. Um, so, yeah, locally to me, the Bible haven't, this, these types, um, they haven't actually returned to the shallow water. I've never managed to film them in winter either. It's always been summer. Um, I've never managed to find the locusts. Obviously, they move into the deeper water. The problem with rivers is, and filming is that I'm literally governed by the weather. So any form of heavy rain literally will destroy anything for me, filming-wise. Um, and that's the biggest problem that I'm finding now is that you know I'm tending to get small windows of opportunity to actually get these fish on film. Um, but yeah, literally to be laid next to these fish, for me, is just absolutely amazing. Um, you know, I never really thought it'd be possible. I know there's a guy out in Italy, and I think there's a, a picture on social media that does its rounds every year. And he's actually sat in the middle of a shoulder barbell feeding them. You know, and I think, oh, I'd love to be doing that. Um, but yeah, it's, they're an amazing creature. Um, I think how they feed is fascinating because they obviously suck up everything and they filter everything through. But the power that they've got surprises me the most because often when I'm in the water, sometimes they can whack the side of the camera and it's as if the camera's been hit by a steam train and you can literally you get a shudder right the way through your body. They are extremely powerful fish. Um, again, unfortunately, they've been heavily predated, um, obviously by the otter. Locally to me, the numbers um, are extremely low. I know certainly back in the 80s, we were getting, um, in the fishing matches, we were getting bags of chill at 100 pounds. They've more or less all disappeared. And it's just predominantly barbel, really, more than anything. But they're not there in the numbers. But last year's filming was encouraging to see all these different year classes. And considering I've filmed at this particular site for over 30 years, and never to have seen them at this particular section, for me, was an absolute bonus. Um, you know, as I said, you know, when you are filming in rivers, because sometimes I'll actually do some filming on, uh, during the night, maybe 10 o'clock at night in winter, and the problem with that is you've, you've literally, you've got to land on the fish immediately. Um, so you've got to do your homework beforehand. But the biggest problem about filming at night in rivers is that you've got um, your limited um, vision just with the underwater video lights. And I, th I think probably the one of the worst times, uh, which was about 10 years ago, I came across a fully dressed porcelain doll while trying to find barbel and it scared the living daylights out of me. Um, but I had to go back and it's, it was just literally the eyes appeared into the torchlight and that was it, it did it for me. Um, whether it's my imagination, certainly filming on the night in rivers, even the bow of a tree can take on the form of a severed limb and I swear blind it's my imagination. Um, I think we've got certainly a lot more that we can do with Barbel, um, certainly from the angling side of things without trying to obviously give away too much. When I'm filming Barbel, sometimes you'll see footage that's done beforehand. That footage is never the location of where I actually filmed the Barbel. And what I've had in the past is some of my friends have said, I've been down to that, I've seen your video, I've been down to the river, I've caught, I've, I've tried to fish for Barbel, but I've had nothing. It's because generally the area is about 45 miles away from where I've actually done um, the filming of the Barbel. So yeah, I do try to um, keep these areas um, to myself, which, yeah, kind of like is a little bit selfish. Um, but there again, I've put a lot of homework into trying to find these various locations. Um, and it's, it's surprising how far Babel will move in a river system. And I think it was 
Dr. Katie Gutman Roberts did the tagging of the Bible, and some of the Bible were traveling up to 18 miles in a river system, which for me was um, a real eye opener. I think someone else did the same with Pike as well, and I think some of them were, some of the bigger Pike were traveling up to about 25 miles. Um, but yeah, I think Barbel are very inquisitive as a species of fish. Um, they've got that fascination about them. Um, they've got that power, that strength. Um, and, and to watch and to get like a unique insight into, into their world, um, for me, is, is fascinating. Because there's not a lot of freshwater footage out there, to be quite honest. Lots of marine footage. But so many people are unaware of this marvellous world that at times can be literally in their town or their village. And they're just totally unaware. And it'd be nice to try and get more people connected with, for me, how important these fish are. Barbel spawning. This was filmed last year. Um, and this has taken me 30 years to get. So I need to now set a new goal. But I've been down to the river, um, I've just gone walking and I've taken the, a long pole and a, and a camera. Just on the off chance that I might see the odd fish, there was no plans to actually film barbel spawning. And I just happened to be walking along and saw these. It's roughly around about six to seven inches depth of water. And there was roughly around about 50 to 60 barbel in this particular section of river. So I obviously got the camera in. It had no effect on how they were, because what I didn't want to do is to obviously walk on the gravels because they're obviously laying the eggs. So I actually use a long, it sounds a bit Heath Robinson this, but it's a long window cleaning pole brush, which has an adapter on, which I can feed out. The beauty of this is it gives me the ability to actually at times move the camera along as, as opposed to just literally using a static camera because sometimes with static cameras you've actually need to position it right onto the where they're going to be laying the eggs and a lot of the times it doesn't always work and I think we've got a little bit of um, footage of them actually laying the eggs coming up so yeah obviously did this and um, it wasn't until I obviously re-watched it back obviously you can tell obviously which the females are because you can obviously see the vent underwater and there's so I might have it actually on this but on many occasions the male would actually come up and put his pectoral fin underneath the vent and tap it just slightly every time that happened generally about 10 seconds afterwards she then started laying her eggs it could be coincidence, I mean, I'm not a fish scientist, um, it's just the type of, you know, I've just managed to get this footage, but for me, this has been a lifelong goal um, to actually spend, I think it was around about 14 hours in total, filming these fish um, using the long pole camera. It was interesting that um, one of the particular females generally the regs in um it was around about nine to ten different batches and she wasn't always using the same areas so she'd lay her eggs and then what she generally does is she'll then rest up for probably around about five minutes the males are wanting a piece of the action so they're harassing her but obviously until she's ready she's not actually gonna want to start doing anything and I got the impression that she's going to be bullied into it. So once she's rested up, um, she'll then get ready. And from what I can work out is, sometimes she was testing the riverbed with her mouth and obviously the barbels. And I think obviously when you get, a, she obviously found a little suitable area. She she then gets into an unbelievable position in, and it's something I've not really noticed when I've viewed spawning barbel from, uh, from bridges or from the riverbank and she gets into this position where she's more of like an S shape and I'm sure we've got some coming up um, I know there is some, some on here um, because I edited it the other night to uh, try and uh, show it coming up yeah some t I think this is the one coming up yeah the problem when I'm filming 
this type of footage, you're filming blind. So you've got the camera on a pole. You've, it's literally hovering above the gravel, but you can never tell if you've got the right angle. So a lot of the times you're thinking, I'm doing all this, I'm spending all these hours. If that footage isn't, yeah, and there's times it could have been angled a little bit better. But I think for a, a first attempt underwater, I think it's fascinating um, to actually get this type of footage, which I, you know, there's not a lot out there of barbel spawning footage actually underwater. There's plenty out there when you, obviously people have been filming them from bridges um, and riverbanks. Um, the general time it took for the female to actually sh uh, shed all her eggs, because when I was down at the river, she, she, this particular one, she started around about nine o'clock in the morning, and um, she then finished by about, probably around about two. Um, so it, it's quite a lengthy time that she um, actually took to shred, to shed all her eggs. Um, and then we, we actually filmed the reds afterwards and it, it was fascinating to realise that you, literally you've got no sign of anything. And that's, that's one of the positions she gets into. And for me, it's the energy she, that she literally exerts into that is fascinating. When she was in that position and obviously laying the eggs, it's surprising other males that were actually in different areas would literally shoot in like exocet missiles all wanting a piece of the action but generally a lot of the time um, when we actually filmed them actually laying the eggs um, they generally had around about four to five males around them all this action then brought in some of the chub as well chub were obviously um, the chub would sit behind the barbel once the female then starts laying her eggs, any, opp any opportunist at feeding on these eggs, the chub would then come in and start gorging on some of the eggs. Um, I think it is a typical female um, barbel will lay between, is it around about 7,000 to um, 8,000 or is it 9,000 eggs, uh, which is a very high number. What that percentage would be, um, that actually reach it to full adulthood um, I'm, I'm, un, I'm unsure and I think it's this one where she uh, she came right in and she was she was nosing down and then she just gets into that position and for me that I mean that the, the like I said the energy that she exerts is just unbelievable and we managed to film this this female for about it was about seven hours and we've got the full egg laying process on film. Um, so yeah, it, it's a goal that I've managed to achieve. Um, I'd like to try and, what I'm hoping to do, and this is a really, really big ask, and uh, whether I can actually get this, I, I have no idea, but I'm wanting to go back and set cameras up uh, where the reds are and actually film the barbel actually coming out of the gravel. Um, yeah, that's literally going to be the right place and the right time, to be quite honest. Um, one of my main concerns locally to me is obviously the, the other water users and um, the canoeists and paddleboarders. Um, certainly at this site, the day after, in one of the areas, they were actually getting in the water and trampling all over, all over the gravels. And it's... For me, those people that use the water alongside us, there needs to be like a little bit of education because I think a lot of them are literally unaware of this world that's going on. Um, the problem is in today's society, if you say anything you do, you tend to get a lot of abuse. Um, many times I've been in the rivers and I've, I've had stones and all sorts chucked at me. Um, I've even, even had used nappies as well um, from where toddlers have been paddling. Um, so yeah, I for me, rivers um, hold that fascination, but the, they're under massive pressure at this present moment in time. Um, and I certainly think we would need to try and do a lot more to obviously encourage them. Um, because, you know, the future, if it carries on, for me, is looking very, very bleak. Because each year I get filming in the river, it does get harder and harder to find these shoals of fish to actually get them on film. You know, when I look back to previous years, um, we seem to be going backwards when I personally think we should be striving to go forwards. And I think with rivers, the problem is people tend to look at them as unimportant. 
And for me, the, the habitat and the ecosystem and the life that these rivers support, not just for obviously the fish life, but other wildlife as well, um, for me is of major importance. Um, just touching back on the sewage issues, um, in September 2000, the then chair of the Environment Agency published a report at the rivers at 92% health. I think it was then in 2020, um, the Environment Agency chair did the same type of report and obviously England's rivers were classed at 14%. So that's, that for me, that we, we are going backwards, we are losing a huge amount and changes need to happen. I think our rivers need to be encouraged to thrive. Um, I think there's a lot more we can do um, as it was touched in the Q&A que um, question time um, over the predation which isn't going to be, that's always going to be an, if an iffy topic to cover but I think it's an important topic to be quite honest because um, for me to see, you know, the decimation um, you know, it, it's sad, um, you know, because I've, I've spent literally half my life in these rivers. Um, so for me, the, the, they've been a massive part um, of not only my filming, but my own personal journey as well, to be quite honest. So we're, at this moment in time, I'm quite undecided how we're going to go about the barbell footage um, spawning um, film. We're not quite sure how to... Um, actually do do something but we're going to look at some type of published video that we can obviously bob online um, I know um, is it Springwatch have been in touch they're possibly interested but I generally know with TV work it's it, it's such a nightmare to actually get involved um, because they're wanting everything for nothing and then they want the rights to the film and you know I think this type of footage um, and I really need to keep to myself um, and again, for obvious reasons, when I was filming the, the spawning barbel, when I do the video, there will be some drone footage, but that actual area will be completely different to where the barbel have been filmed spawning. Um, again, it's, it's just down about protecting site, and that's one of the reds um, where those minnows are. Um, it was round about probably 12 inches long, um, unsure about depth, but again you've literally got no idea that under those pebbles is the next generation of Babel and I think it's quite amazing to be quite honest that um, you know this goes on literally on our doorstep um, and getting that unique insight into actually seeing a world which we know little about for me is just fantastic so I hope you've enjoyed the video footage um, if anyone's got any questions, I will try and answer them the best I can. Um, if not, then thank you ever so much for listening. And I hope you've enjoyed it and you've obviously picked something up that might improve your angling with Babel. I know a lot of you probably won't need any improvement, so it might, be me, it might be have to be me that watches it. <laughs> any questions or anything? Yeah. That was last weekend, last Saturday and Sunday, yeah, which I thought was very early because the water temperature was 8 degrees. I always thought the water temperature had to be a little bit higher. Um, so yeah, that surprised me the most to be quite honest, but yeah, 8 degrees was the uh, river temperature. Pardon? Yes, yeah, that, yeah, it was on the wharf. I'm going to say the majority of filming on, uh, literally for my barbel, is either the swale um, or the river wharf. Um, I've got a few private sections as well, uh, which I'm allowed to go film on. Um, I don't know if any of you know Ray Wood um, on the river wharf. Um, I've got access to film there at the other side because it's all private. Um, but as it stands, the, the barbel haven't turned up there yet at the moment but I think they obviously are on the move um, so yeah, it should be a fascinating fascinating year this year if I can obviously do more and if I can get those little barbel coming out of the gravel that would be the icing on the cake
Yeah, it's yeah, because um, I've, I've no idea why, but I've been added to a stand-up paddleboarders group. <laughs> why I don't know. Um, and actually sent them an email about saying, can you try and avoid the shallow gravels? Um, and they were actually they were quite obliging. Whether that gets passed on or not, I don't know. Um, but yeah, so, you know, I suppose it's one option um, because I know certainly locally to me. The Angling Club um, are doing a lot more work um, to do with restoration, to do with river, river habitat, and this, that, and the other. Um, you know, and I think, I think anglers themselves, um, because there's, there's, there's times we, we tend to get a lot of bad press, but, you know, generally we do care about the fish. You know, and I think you know, there's a lot of clubs up and down the country that I know of that have done some amazing work, you know, restoring some of the habitat. And that so yeah I, I think the you know the clubs up and down the country are, are, are amazing sorry I can't. yeah yeah I was gonna say certainly uh, when I first started out, trying to find barbel sp spawning was very, very difficult, but certainly last year, um, there were certainly a lot more sections, certainly where there was potential to actually get barbel spawning on film. Um, and this section where I filmed them on the River Wharf, um, literally, um, because of the floods, I think it was January and February, brought down a load of gravel and actually created this um, bed, which is round about um, underwater, making it about five to seven inches deep. Um, so obviously the barbel have picked up on this because last year it was, I think it was round about three to four feet deep. So it's surprising, yeah, I think, you know, these rivers are changing constantly. Um, it, it is fascinating to see how these changes occur with obviously the moving gravels. Yeah, as that, that's one thing I want to try and do this year is use the footage that I can gain to try and help the populations of fish that are obviously in our rivers. I'll, I'll film anything. I've, I've been in rivers and filmed the sewage. For the Panorama program, I actually I ended up having to, they asked me if I'd get in a proper discharge. I'll never do it again. But yeah, I mean, I, by the time I'd finished, I was covered in everything. For, I won't go into details because there might be young ears here, but it was vile. So yeah, I'll, I'd film anything. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I don't think there's actually that much out there about the flipped reverse side of the coin, is there? So, so yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll film anything, me. Yeah, lovely. Thank you very much, anyway. <laughs>